All right. Well, welcome back to the Mac Advanced Campfire Sessions. We're going to go ahead and continue with today's second half. Our uh, second speakers are Mark Morozinski. Say hello. Hello. And uh, Michael Epping. Hello to both hey, of you. Everybody. And they will be presenting on the top five ways to improve your Apple end user experience in Microsoft 365 or Azure Active Directory. If you'd like to go ahead and share your slides, we can go ahead and get started. Can you confirm if you can see them? Yep, we can see your slides and you are ready to go. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining the top five ways to improve your Apple end user experience in Azure AD and Microsoft 365. I'm Mark Morzinski, and I'm here with Michael Epping. And something we try to do to be more inclusive of those with a visual impairment is just quickly describe what we look like. So I am a late 30s white male with uh, medium length brown hair. I'm wearing a black shirt today and I have glasses that are blue and black. Michael. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Epping. I'm a white male in my mid 30s with uh, medium length brown hair. I'm wearing a bluish shirt. All right, thanks. I think he gets a little younger every time we uh, do this. So uh, Michael and I are uh, product managers in the identity division at Microsoft. So we work on Active Directory, Active Directory Federation Services and Azure Active Directory. And we work with customers on their deployments of Azure Active Directory, and we take the learnings and feedback from those deployments and we work it back into the product to make it easier and better for everybody to use. Now, some of the customers that Michael and I work with actually have a pretty large Mac footprint, and we've been working with them over the last year or so to try to improve that end user experience. And we wanted to take those learnings and feedback and work it back into the Mac admins community for the session. Now, Michael and I are also members of the Mac admin Slack. You may have seen us in there trying to answer questions from time to time. So we've tried to include some of the common questions we see there in this presentation as well. Now we have a lot to cover, um, but don't worry, we're gonna make the slides available at the very end. There'll be a link to where you can download these slides. And uh, we also have three people from our team in the chat, so feel free to ask any questions. We have Grace, Oana, and Curtis, so feel free to ask questions and they'll answer them. And we should have a little bit of time at the end to cover anything that we weren't able to cover in the chat. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So first we're gonna talk about what is Azure AD and conditional access. So if you have Office 365 and you have Azure, you have Azure AD. Now Azure AD is not just an identity provider for those two services. It's a full blown identity access solution uh, service as a solution. And I'll cover that a little bit at the end and some of the things that you can do with that. Now a trend that we started to see with a lot of our customers that was greatly accelerated by COVID was people wanting to work outside of the office. They wanted to work from home, work at a coffee shop and the resources that they're accessing are going to be cloud services and more SaaS app, less on-prem, and the devices that they're using, like most of their work, it's done on maybe their corporate assigned device, but they want to be able to work from their phone, maybe work from their personal iPad, and we started to see this more and more. And what you'll find here is that that traditional network is the perimeter where everything inside is good and everything outside is bad. It's kind of started to drift away and identity actually becomes that uh, new perimeter. And if you've been to any Azure AD sessions before, you may have heard someone talk about this as identity as the control plane. And this is where Azure AD comes into the picture. So there's a lot we could talk about from Azure AD. Like I said, feel free to ask any questions um, in, the, in the chat, but something I really wanted to make sure I got um, got across to this audience was that Azure AD is built on open standards. So this means things like OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, SAML, and SKIM. And if you actually look at any of the Microsoft services, uh, you'll see that under the covers, they are built on OpenID Connect. Now, um, we have, uh, we're have we continuing to invest in new standards, things like FIDO, things like the Decentralized Identity Framework. And we actually have a whole team of people that do this. If anyone's from the identity world here, they may know Pam Dingle, she's great. Her team works with these different standards bodies to help define emerging standards. And a good example of this is passkeys. So if you had to take a look at ak.ms slash passkeys announcement, this was from the FIDO Alliance that is going to be supported by Microsoft, Apple, and Google. And someone from her team, Tim, helped work on this. So not only are they helping work on what the new standards are, they're also working on making sure that Azure AD will support these standards when this comes out. So this is really, really important because if you have any applications that support OAuth 2 or OpenID Connect or, or SAML or SKIM, you can get them integrated into Azure AD pretty quickly. And this is really important because then we can use features like conditional access. Now, conditional access, for those that aren't aware, is one of our more popular features. It's our zero trust authentication and authorization engine. You have a set of conditions you can pick as an admin. If those conditions um, are, are <clears throat> true, then there are certain controls that the user or device will need to pass. 
And if they do pass those, then they get access to that resource. So it's, it's there in the name, conditional access. Now, a common question we see in the Mac admin Slack is, when does conditional access run? You know, I logged in and got access to an application in the morning. I got prompted for MFA, um, and then I tried to access that same application later in the day, and I didn't get prompted. Does conditional access even work? Um, so conditional access is evaluated every time a user or device is requesting access to a resource to get that access token. Now, when that access token expires, that depends on a bunch of different things, and we'll cover that a little bit later today. This goes back to how OAuth and OpenID Connect work, but conditional access is evaluated every time time you go to get an access token. Now, what are some of the conditions you can configure as an admin? Uh, first, like wh where the user is coming from. If we're concerned about any risk or something suspicious happening on the account, we can configure things for that. The state of the device. So is it a corporate device? Is it a mobile device? Is it Mac? Is it Windows? You can configure different policies for those different device types. And application requirements. So you can actually have a conditional access policy that says if you're coming from a mobile device, and you're trying to get to Exchange Online, you have to come from Outlook Mobile because then the users can't accidentally download attachments to their personal OneDrive or their personal Dropbox. They have to save it to their uh, corporate OneDrive or their corporate Dropbox. So there's a lot that we can do here from a conditional access perspective. So let's look at how these uh, conditional access policies are applied. Now, another common question we see in the Mac admin Slack is they want like conditional access policy number one to, to go and then if that doesn't apply then they want the second one to apply and if that one does apply then they want a third policy to apply unfortunately conditional access does not work that way all the policies are anded together there is no type of precedence if you are familiar with active directories group policy with the local site domain and ou it doesn't work like that it's all anded together so the first question that's asked when you have conditional access policies is is there a is there a policy and scope of the request if the answer is yes it then moves on to the controls the first control is a block control so if you have a block control that will always be satisfied first a deny always will win then the grant controls are applied in this order of risk, MFA, device, and then that approved client app. Now, something to keep in mind is that conditional access will try to satisfy that policy without having to interact with the user. So if you have a conditional access policy that says you have to do MFA or come from a compliant device, if the user is not coming from a compliant device, they will then be prompted for MFA. So here in this example on the right, you can see that Michael tried to log into the Azure portal and he was coming from a non-compliant device because the is compliant attribute is set to false. That's what the red arrow is pointing at. So in this case, he would then be challenged to complete an MFA challenge response. Now, if he was coming from a compliant device, he would have not got prompted for MFA because we've been able to satisfy that control with the compliant device. So it's really, really important as Mac admins that we understand what are the conditional access policies in our environment. So you wanna make sure you go back and talk to your identity access management team or your security team to understand what your policies are because it can greatly impact your end user experience. So what are some common policies we see with customers? First, requiring all users to do MFA. This is excellent. This is starting to become more and more prevalent. So I'm, I'm guessing you're gonna have a policy like that. Um, Blocking legacy authentication protocols. These are things that cannot do modern web flows. So things like POP3, IMAP4, you may have started blocking those protocols already. Um, blocking based on country or region. So um, you, you, we've seen customers say like, I don't have any users in this region. I have no business interest in this region. I have no reason to have anyone sign in from there. We're gonna go ahead and block that. Um, starting to require to come from a corporate device. So if you have a Windows device, this could be hybrid domain joined, or it can be a compliant device that's determined by your MDM provider. And then we're also starting to see the inverse of this, which is stricter controls for non-corporate managed devices. So this is always like the, the grandma's workstation argument that people make that they're at their grandma's house for Thanksgiving or Christmas or something like that, and they decide they're gonna do a couple hours of work and they're gonna use her computer for some reason. The security team will say, we don't want that session to be persistent for you know days or weeks. So we're gonna uh, have a sign-in frequency policy that requires them to log in every two hours. And if um, we found with some customers that if the Macs have not been properly integrated from the MDM perspective, they're going to show up as a non-corporate managed device and these stricter controls may be being applied in your environment. So if that's the case, you're gonna to wanna to go talk to your security team or your uh, access management team about this. Um, now, beware, they may say that this is good from a security perspective. They're gonna say, we practice zero trust, we don't trust anyone. We don't trust any devices. We don't trust anything. We want people to re-authenticate. That is proving that they are who they say they are. This is good from a security perspective. And on the surface, 
in theory, that sounds like it would be correct. Um, but here in uh, with some of our customers, we found that it's probably actually having the opposite effect of that. So let's talk about why prompting can be bad, especially when you over prompt your users. Um, so we found some when talking about this on Twitter, uh, Amy said, hey, everybody, PSA, don't blindly accept your MFA request if you're not trying to log into something, which is really good advice. And somebody responded saying that uh, they knew of a company that every single morning they refreshed their credentials of all of their users and their entire workforce got a push notification to log in whether they initiated access to anything or not. So that sounds like a very miserable user experience. And then um, Kay Reed here said that uh, he wants to write an app that tracks how many hours per week he spends two of into different collaboration systems. And we thought that was actually a really interesting idea and we have something that I think he would probably like here in a few slides. But let's talk about actual customer case study. So one of our customers is a European financial services customer. They have their red team doing, you know, practice runs and cyber attacks and things like that. So they're running through their playbook. They're doing a password spray attack. This is where we take a easily guessable password. So right now, something like summer with a capital S 2022 exclamation point and they try this against all the users in their environment and we know that at least one percent of your users are going to fall to this type of attack so they had some users that fell to this they had their uh, accounts username and password and they asked their leadership team they said hey can we just like hammer these people with mfa prompts and see what happens so the leadership team says sound good we'll let the help desk know so when they call we can tell them what's happening go for it so this is what they found uh first of all Nobody called the help desk to report anything was odd, so that's off to a really bad start. Many of these users blindly approved the MFA requests that were coming in, so that's not good. And one user was so fed up with the number of requests, they just deleted the Authenticator app off their phone entirely. Like, like I can't even deal with this. I have to get my work done. They just deleted the app itself. So this is uh, absolutely what we don't want to be happening with customer environments. So what happens here is when you when you start over prompting your users, it can lead to compromise because you're teaching your users bad behaviors. You're teaching your users to consistently give up their credentials many times a day into whatever login screen they see. And when you start adding MFA into the mix, and when they get those five, six, or seven MFA prompts a day, when the attacker logs in with their username and password and they get that ninth prompt, they're going to just accept it because they're used to accepting five, six, seven prompts a day. So it's really bad from a security perspective. From a productivity perspective, this goes back to K Reed's tweet there. Um, it's really bad. It impacts productivity. Um, people like it ruins their workflows. They have to always have their phone near them. And this is especially bad on platforms without any single sign on capabilities. And by default, out of the box, there is no single sign on with Mac OS and Azure AD. But don't worry, Michael's going to talk about that here in a few slides. We're going to be able to get that back on the right track. But really, what we should be striving for here is improving the user experience and improving and improving security so we really only want to prompt our users when it's truly truly needed things like when they get a new device things like when they're coming in from a location that we've never seen them come before um, there's a change in their risk policy we might be want to prompt those users and we, when we do prompt them we want to use passwordless credentials when we can because this will make when we do prompt them it will make it less impactful it gives a better end user experience and we'll talk about passwords passwordless here in a little bit okay so let's get into the top five recommendations. The first recommendation here is determine if you have a prompting problem and you wanna show it with data. So unless you're an organization that has been actively working on this, you can uh, probably have a little bit of room for improvement and you wanna be able to show that with data. Now, someone on our team um, used to work in Power BI and he has a shirt that says, in God we trust, all others bring data. And the data you need to show this is in your Azure AD sign-in logs. So everything you need is there. And if you go to aka.ms slash MFA prompt work prompts workbook, um, we have a whole bunch of charts in there. Um, you can take a look at that. So your sign-in logs have to be sent to Azure Monitor and Azure Log Analytics to do this. If you are not using Azure Log, Anal Log Analytics, that's okay. Go to this workbook anyways, and you can actually see what all of the queries are. But you go, when you go to them and you click edit, you can see all of the logic behind that. And you just need to write the same logic in wherever you're sending your Azure AD logs to. So Splunk, QRadar, Summa Logic, Kibana, it doesn't really matter. Go take a look at this workbook and take the logic and, and recreate that in your seam. Or if you're sending your logs to Log Analytics, you can use this workbook. All right, so what's some of the stuff that you can see in this workbook? Uh, things like who is getting the most prompts in your environment? And this can be an eye-opening experience for some of their customers. You also see the average amount of prompts per user. What applications have a high prompt count? We've had some customers find that the applications 
were misconfigured and asking for reauthentication much more than they needed to. So you can see things like that. What is the device state that's getting prompt? So here you can see on the right that 95% of these uh, in this environment, 95% of the devices are unmanaged. So they would fall into that stricter conditional access policy I talked about where they're getting prompted more frequently. So one of the things that we're gonna wanna do here is look for this and move those unmanaged devices to a managed device state. And then Michael's gonna talk about that here in our second recommendation. All right, recommendation number two is all about MDM. So we highly recommend that you enroll in MDM and if possible, use device compliance so that you can structure those conditional access policies correctly. Uh, so let's start with uh, one, some of the reasons why you might want to do MDM management. What we found is not all customers have moved over to MDM quite yet. And one of the reasons is because MDM is the only modern way to deploy SSO features to Mac OS. MDM helps us improve device identity and security via that conditional access integration. And it also helps us deploy SSO profiles to the device that helps us improve that end user experience. So we can drive down the number of prompts that we're sending our end users, and we can improve the security around prompting because we won't be training our users to uh, respond to, to random prompts that they get because we'll be prompting them less. Any given prompt that comes in should trigger a response in them where they understand that uh, they, they think about is this my prompt or is this from someone else? So I want to really make it clear that these are related but different features. We always now recommend that customers use MDM, uh, but if you don't want to deploy the conditional access feature, you can still use SSO. Or if you just want to deploy the conditional access piece and you don't care about SSO with Azure AD, you can do that as well. These are both delivered through the MDM channel, but you can pick and choose either one. And we see a lot of confusion around that. So I really wanted to specify that these are different features. If you're using Intune as your MDM, uh, Intune natively sends compliance information to Azure AD. So if you're using Intune, make sure you're applying compliance policies to your devices, and you'll be able to use that information in your conditional access policies today. If you're using a non-Intune MDM, we do have third-party integrations. So if you're Jamf Pro, I know Jamf Pro is super popular. Uh, we have customers using VMware Workspace ONE. Uh, we have these integrations with other MDMs, and I'll touch briefly on how these work in a little bit. Uh, we think it's worth it to go integrate these as well so that you can use that same information in your device-based CA policies. So regardless of whether or not you use Intune or an Intune integrated MDM, if possible, try to integrate them so that we can get that device identity into our conditional access policies. So again, without MDM, Azure AD is going to see all the Macs as unmanaged, and therefore they're going to look like devices that we should maybe apply more stringent policies to that can impact end user experience. So again, good Mac OS security requires two specific things, device health attestation and SSO deployed through the MDM channel to reduce those auth prompts. So just to illustrate how this works, if we have our end user devices, and this could be iOS devices, Android devices, Macs, Windows, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the device will be enrolled into Intune if Intune's your MDM of choice, and the Intune client and the MDM profile on that device report their compliance status to an Intune cloud service. And then that Intune cloud service reports that compliance state to Azure AD. So within Azure AD, there is a database that has device objects in it. And when you're signing in, that conditional access policy that we showed earlier, where it shows is compliant, true or false, what Azure AD is checking is that device object in Azure AD's database to see that compliance state. So that information gets fed to us through Intune. If you use a third party MDM, it looks a little bit like this, where you have your MDM partner, whether it's Jamf Pro, VMware AirWatch, and that partner still feeds the compliance information to the Intune cloud service. So these don't talk directly to Azure AD, but they talk to an Intune API in the Intune cloud service. So just like before, the devices send compliance status or the MDM service sends compliance status to the Intune cloud service. And the same thing happens where the Intune cloud service provides that compliance information to Azure AD. And then in your conditional access policies, Azure AD can use that device information about whether or not the device is healthy and compliant or not, and a corporate managed device or not in your CA policies. So if you use a non-Intune MDM, uh, we do think that uh, this is worth it, even though there is extra work involved in getting that integration up and running. So number three 
is set up that SSO infrastructure. So if we've followed advice in number two, and now we have MDM for our Macs, and we're managing those Macs and getting their device state into Azure AD, we can very easily move on to number three, which is deploying SSO profiles to our Macs. So I want to touch base very briefly on the different forms of SSO that are available on Macs, because we do see some confusion about this. So historically, the way to provide SSO access to applications on a Mac was via Kerberos, traditionally via binding the, the Mac to an on-premise LDAP store, such as Active Directory. So you're essentially doing domain join for Mac OS. Apple has been actively telling customers to move away from this. This is not the preferred approach anymore. So if you're still binding your Macs to Active Directory, you do want to start thinking about your roadmap to moving to some of the more modern techniques. So in terms of modernization, the native solution from Apple is Apple's Kerberos SSO extension. And one of the key differences here is that this requires an MDM. So in order to deploy this Kerberos extension, the modern method for doing Kerberos SSO, you have to have those Macs under MDM management, hence the recommendation in number two. However, this is still designed for on-premise directory services, not really designed for the cloud. So Kerberos is fundamentally a thing that gets used in on-premise Active Directory. And as Mark mentioned earlier, a trend that we've seen for many years and that got accelerated during COVID is a lot of people are uh, working remotely, accessing services that are not on the on-prem network. It's not a good assumption to, to make to think that all of the apps that our users might need to access are on the internal network. So there is another form of SSO that uses modern authentication or tokens. Uh, and this is via Apple's extensible enterprise SSO framework where IDP vendors can come create plugins that sit on top of this framework that Apple has developed and given to us. So we're an IDP vendor since we make Azure AD, so we went and did this. And just like their modern Kerberos SSO extension, these have to be deployed through the MDM channel. So if you are not managing your Macs with MDM, you will not be able to deploy these, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. There's actually two subtypes of the uh, extensible enterprise SSO framework. There's a type called credential, and then there's a type called redirect. Azure AD's option is the redirect type, so we're primarily going to focus on how this works. So for those uh, Kerberos SSO extensions, if you're using Kerberos, and this could be uh, via LDAP bind, it could be via Apple's Kerberos SSO extension, it could be Jam Connect, it could be other tools like the older Nomad tools. Uh, there's various different ways to, uh, to do this. In general, Kerberos kind of works the same way regardless of which one of the tools you're using. Uh, so if you are deploying the, the SSO uh, extension for Kerberos, the way that this works is the user provides their device with their enterprise username and password. The device sends those credentials to Active Directory and asks for what's called a Kerberos ticket granting ticket or a TGT. Active Directory validates those creds and then returns that TGT. So now the device has this TGT in hand. When the user wants to access an application, uh, whether it's in a browser or a desktop client application, they're not going to be able to because the application would want a Kerberos ticket. So this could be something like an SMB file share, a print server, uh, could be an, a website running on IIS, uh, anything that integrates with, with Active Directory for Kerberos. So what the device does next is that it sends its TGT to Active Directory. And this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but in general, the story is correct. Uh, it asks for a ticket that is specific to the application that it is trying to access or what we call a TGS. It then validates that TGT, Active Directory validates the TGT, returns the TGS to the device, and then the user's client application on the device can present the TGS to the application server, and the user successfully accesses the application. So this is SSO, single sign-on, because the user only had to provide their enterprise credentials once. They're not prompted every time they go to a different application. So I either sign on to the device with my enterprise credentials, depending on your configuration, or I uh, provide those enterprise credentials once I've signed on with a local account on the Mac. And then once the Mac gets that TGT, it can use that TGT to acquire these TGSs and get access to the applications. So a single sign-on for that end user. So just to illustrate what this looks like, uh, you can run the command K list uh, in the terminal on your Mac to see the list of Kerberos tickets. So I have a curb TGT up top, which I got from Active Directory. So this is specific to the device and the user. And then when I try to access a specific application, uh, so in my example here, I just went to a file share running on my domain controller. So that's what the CIFS 
uh, item is, that second yellow line, that's a TGS that's specific to the application. And as you access additional applications, you'll see the device acquire additional TGSs. So there are some issues with this story like we outlined. It doesn't work very well over the internet. It's not very modern. Again, a lot of organizations are moving towards SaaS applications, towards remote users, not relying on VPNs as heavily. There, uh, it's not a safe assumption to think that our applications and our end users are going to be able to see our on-premise Active Directory environment. So let's imagine we have a SaaS application instead of that internal Kerberos application. So if we were still using Kerberos, it wouldn't really make sense. If my user is remote on the internet, what would happen? I could provide my enterprise user credentials to the device, so username and password for Active Directory, and then what should the device do with them? It could send the credentials to Active, try to send the credentials to Active Directory, but it's not going to find a domain controller generally unless it's on a VPN. And generally, this is not our desired state. Uh, if we're practicing good zero trust practices, we may want to start moving users away from VPNs. Uh, it may be burdensome to have all of our users on a VPN in order to access SaaS applications that are available on the internet. This just isn't really the modern approach. So that's where we want to modernize with our modern auth extensions. So again, the solution here is built on top of modern auth. So SAML is good. A lot of apps out there support SAML, things like ServiceNow, Slack, uh, there's a whole wide range of things. Uh, and even better is OpenID Connect and OAuth. So again, this is what a lot of the Microsoft services are built on. Web-based authentication or modern auth gives us a lot of flexibility. So you can see here, this is just the Azure AD sign-in page and it is web-based authentication. And the flexibility of that web-based authentication lets us build many, many more options for handling user authentication and security than we have with on-premise Active Directory, where typically you can just send a username and a password and that's it. So we can do things like challenge for certificates, which is one of the things that we do when we check to see if a device is managed or not. Uh, there's many more forms of multi-factor authentication we can support, such as FIDO keys, authenticator apps, smart cards, SMS codes. On Windows, we have Windows Hello for Business. Uh, we can direct traffic through proxied, uh, through a proxy service if we want to do things like block downloads on unmanaged devices. And there's a bunch of other options, like if we want to control how long a session is good for, all sorts of things. So this is much, much more modern and has many more capabilities than our Kerberos authentication uh, that we've historically used has. So I want to touch really quickly on how this actually functions. Like what are the, the things uh, when I say tokens that actually make this run? So just to remind you, our goal here is to prompt once per user, per device, typically per password change. So we don't really want to bother the user with additional authentication prompts if nothing has changed. They haven't changed their password. Their user risk hasn't changed in the identity protection space. Uh, they're on the same device that they've been authenticating from. They're in the same location. There's not necessarily a need for us to go make them interactively re-authenticate. So the first thing that we need here is what's called a primary refresh token. And what a PRT is, is a long-term authentication token that is held by an SSO broker. So we have a broker that's built into Windows. It's called the Web Authentication Manager. On Mac OS, we have a broker, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, iOS, we have a broker, Android, et cetera. Uh, so all these brokers are using a thing called a PRT to maintain long-term session state. So once the user acquires a PRT in the broker on their device, that is specific to that user on that device. And it's good typically until it's revoked or until something changes, like the user's password changes, at which point we may need to prompt them so that they can get a fresh PRT. But until something changes, that PRT is going to be valid as long as the user is using their device uh, every 14 days. If they go on a long vacation, they may get prompted when they come back. Then when the user wants to access an application, like I open the Outlook client on my Mac and I want to connect to Exchange Online, uh, we need to get a refresh and access token pair that is specific to the cloud service that I'm trying to access. So it could be Exchange Online, it could be SharePoint Online in my browser, et cetera, et cetera. So the refresh token, access token pair are acquired by that broker. So my client application, whether it's Outlook or Safari, might talk to the broker on my Mac that has that PRT and say, I want a refresh token, access token pair for, say, Exchange Online. 
the refresh token that's specific to Exchange Online will carry claims in it, like whether or not MFA has been satisfied or other pieces of information like that. Again, we want to retain that information so that we don't make the user go back and prompt them for MFA all the time. If they've already done MFA, we can cache that information and only prompt them when needed. And then the access token, which is good for about an hour, is what they use to actually access the service. So the client application sends the access token to the cloud service, and that's what they use to actually authenticate to that cloud service. These are very short-lived since this is the thing that actually gives access to the resource. So about once an hour, your client application is going to ask the broker to go get it a fresh access token. And every time it does that, so once an hour per application, it's going to evaluate conditional access again. And like we said, if nothing's changed, they should just get a fresh access token. But if something has changed, like they changed their password, the user's risky, you've disabled the user account because maybe they're being terminated, things along those lines, it's at that point that they will be, their access will be uh, blocked because they will not be able to pass the conditional access policies. So these are the artifacts that we have on the device that make this whole thing tick. So, just to touch on some of the prerequisites for doing this uh, modern auth and all this PRT stuff on Apple platforms, you need an IDP that supports SAML or OpenID Connect generally. So for us, that's Azure AD. Uh, there's other things on the market out there. You need to integrate, integrate your apps with that IDP. So if your applications are not integrated with the IDP, these SSO technologies are not going to help you. So we'll talk a little bit about app integration uh, coming up, but you want to get those apps integrated with the IDP so that you can provide this type of SSO and security functionality to all of your applications. Your IDP vendor has to create an SSO extension plugin. So we've done that for everybody here. You have to have those Macs under MDM management, and then uh, we'll move into the deployment. So again, that modern approach is to use a modern auth IDP and tokens. So what do we do on our Macs? So for us, for the Azure AD implementation of that, the primary prerequisite is that the Microsoft Company Portal app needs to be installed on the device. Again, this does not mean that you must use Intune as your MDM. Uh, we actually just built the broker into the Microsoft Company Portal app. So even if you use a different MDM, you're not integrating with Intune, you don't use Intune whatsoever, the company portal can still be that authentication broker that possesses the PRTs and that applications can talk to for SSO. So again, Intune usage is not required. Uh, you just have to have this application installed for its broker logic. So what will happen is the user authenticates to what we call the SSO extension window. So this can be done by opening up the company portal application, or uh, we can actually prompt for this in other apps. So if you follow our config guidance, which I'll show you in a little bit, uh, you can actually have it set so that the user never needs to open company portal, and we can still get them to authenticate, get that PRT into their broker, and then provide SSO. So again, Azure AD supports many more credential types than on-prem Active Directory does. So preferably you could do a passwordless sign-in using phone sign-in uh, in the Microsoft Authenticator app, or it could be username, password, plus a different form of MFA, such as apps, SMS codes, OTP codes, et cetera. So once they authenticate to the broker, uh, the Azure AD SSO extension is going to acquire that PRT from your Azure AD tenant and it's gonna store it locally on the device. So we protect it with the keychain just using standard operating system mechanisms. So again, that PRT is good for a rolling 14 day window. It is constantly refreshed as the user uses the Mac by default. I wanna call out that there's actually one more wrinkle in that there's two different flows for applications to talk to the broker. So the first one we're gonna talk about is what we call the MSAL flow. MSAL is Microsoft Authentication Library. This is a library we provide to any Microsoft customer who wants to use it that makes it very easy to do OAuth integrations with Azure AD. So if you want to build your own applications uh, and they want to and you want to integrate them with Azure AD for authentication and authorization, would highly recommend taking a look at MSAL and using it in your app to make doing your OAuth implementation really, really straightforward. So we take care of a lot of the best practices and heavy lifting for you. So if your app uses OAuth, so something like the Outlook client, it can talk directly to the broker. It is a broker aware application. So we've built the MSAL library to know about brokers. So that app can call directly into the SSO broker and say, I want that access token so I can go connect to say my mailbox and exchange online. 
So the broker goes and talks to Azure AD with its PRT in hand. Azure AD validates that PRT, and if all is good, and it passes all the conditional access checks and the users enabled, et cetera, the application or Azure AD returns that app-specific token. Then that token is passed to the client application and the client app sends the token to the cloud service or the application. So the user at this point has successfully accessed the app. I can download my mailbox content, see my files in SharePoint, get into my ServiceNow instance, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at the other flow, which is the redirect flow. And this is where Apple has built some, op some magic into the operating system for us. So in this example, the user tries to get into a application, say SharePoint Online from a app that does not use MSAL. So for example, Safari does not have Microsoft's authentication library built into it, but we still might want to have SSO in Safari. So the user tries to get into SharePoint Online or some other application protected by Azure AD, and that app says, I need you to go get a token from Azure AD. So that app that doesn't use mCell tries to go to an Azure AD URL, such as login.microsoftonline.com. However, if we've set our profiles up correctly that we're sending down from our MDM, the macOS network stack basically intercepts this traffic and redirects it to the SSO extension. So this gives us the ability to do OS level uh, redirection for those authentication calls. At that point, the same thing happens as before, where the SSO extension uses its PRT to ask Azure AD for a token. If everything checks out, Azure AD returns that token, and then it can pass it back to the client application, which uses it to access whatever resource it was trying to get to. So this allows us to do SSO for things like Safari, the Jamf self-service portal, uh, VPN clients, you name it, as long as it fits a certain uh, uh, profile, if it, ha if it meets the right criteria, it can interact with the macOS network stack, which can redirect these auth calls to the broker. So giving us that SSO, that nice smooth user experience where we're not overly prompting our users for things that don't use Microsoft's libraries. So there's a couple uh, things that I wanna talk about in terms of actually deploying this. So again, you must do this via an MDM. We've tried to make this as easy as possible if you're using Intune. So if you go into Intune and you create a single sign-on app extension profile, uh, you can select from the dropdown and just pick Azure AD, and we will pre-configure most of the settings for you. There's a couple additional settings you can see at the bottom in the uh, key type and value table there uh, that we do recommend configuring. And this is all captured at that link, aka.ms slash Apple SSO dash Intune. Uh, that is our guide for configuring SSO in Intune if that's your MDM of choice. So we try to keep it pretty simple. Jamf Pro requires a little bit more work and a plist file upload. Uh, so we did end up writing a guide specific to Jamf Pro because I found that a lot of customers were running into issues. So again, we have an aka.ms link at apple sso jamf Pro. This is a Jamf Pro config guide uh, specifically that we wrote for you Jamf Pro customers. So you can see on the left-hand side, there's a few additional things you have to configure. You have to configure uh, information about the broker application that we're going to redirect that traffic to. So you can see it's com.microsoft.companyportalmac.sso extension. So that's that sub component within the company portal that provides SSO. You have to set the sign-on type to redirect. And then you can see in the upper right, we can configure which URLs we're going to do that redirection for. And this is the reason that Apple enforces the MDM requirement. The ability to redirect network traffic is very powerful and you could do some very nasty things if you had the ability to do that. So the only way to deploy these types of profiles where you're intercepting network traffic is via MDM. There's no way to sideload this configuration onto a device because it'd be very dangerous to do so. So you configure which URLs you want to redirect. And then finally, you upload your plist file. So we have the uh, sample plist that we wrote uh, that we recommend starting with in the lower right-hand corner. And again, this is listed on the docs page, so you can just copy and paste it. Uh, you can configure which applications should have redirection done for them. Uh, this browser SSO interaction enabled one is the piece that allows you to prompt the user to provision and get that PRT from non-company portal applications. And I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, and then there's a few other options that you can configure here as well. So again, if you configure this the way we recommend, generally the user should never need to open the company portal application. So 
the redirect SSO extension must be deployed via MDM, and if you configure it correctly, what you can see here in this screenshot is what the end user experience looks like uh, when they were uh, told to provision and get that PRT. So in this example, I did not sign into the SSO extension in company portal. Instead, I opened Safari, and here I actually did it in a private tab, and I said, I'm going to go to portal.office.com, and because I configured my profile correctly, my Safari client wanted to redirect to the SSO extension, and the SSO extension provided this pop-up window where my user can authenticate. So I can do username, password, passwordless sign-in, et cetera. And as long as I sign in correctly, I will get that PRT, and all of my applications can piggyback on that PRT for tokens. So I sign in a single time, and then all of my apps that integrate with Azure AD can use that PRT for SSO. So just to reiterate, Company Portal must always be installed. But again, if you follow our config guide, users don't actually need to open it. You can provision SSO in other apps like I show here. Uh, and again, just to reiterate this one as well, you do not need to use Intune for this. I, this comes up all the time. You do not need to do conditional access integration with Intune, although we recommend it, uh, to, to do SSO. Any customer who uses Office 365 or Azure AD could benefit from deploying the SSO extension. Uh, and just a little tip, uh, I find that the easiest tool to actually test if your profile is working is actually Safari. Uh, so what I like to do is I like to launch Safari in private browsing mode like I'm showing here, uh, because even in private browsing mode, Safari will still be redirected to the broker. So it's a great way to test and see if things are working relatively easily. So just a few limitations, caveats, warnings to call out. The SSO extension component from Microsoft, so the plugin that we built that sits on top of Apple's framework, is still in public preview. For, the, for us, that means it's fully supported. So if you wanna deploy it, you can call support. Microsoft support will uh, be able to help you. Uh, but we're still working on a couple bugs uh, before we go GA. So a few minor things to resolve, and then we'll be able to declare general, general availability. But just know, if you do deploy today, it is a supported solution. Again, apps must use Microsoft's auth libraries or Apple system frameworks for those network requests. This means that some apps do not work with the SSO extension. The SSO extension is unaware of them because they don't use the MCEL library, and Apple's network stack is unaware of them because they don't use Apple's network stack. The main culprits here that come up time and again are Chrome and Firefox. Uh, they implement networking in a way where they don't use Apple's networking frameworks, and therefore the SSO extension is not aware of them. So something to keep in mind. So if you do care about SSO for your browsers, I would highly recommend using Safari or Microsoft Edge. Uh, we are updating Edge to integrate with the broker natively. So for other applications, talk to your app vendors about the need to support SSO extensions. Apple has made it clear that SSO extensions are going to become more important over time. And so if you have vendors who are not playing nicely with the SSO extension, you may want to nudge them to see if they can rework their application so that it can support these SSO extensions. Again, those plist files for those non-Intune MDMs are a little bit hard to manage. So I just want to call out that we're considering changes to the default settings in the uh, SSO uh, software, where if you kind of screw up the plist file a little bit, the defaults might still work uh, and be a little more friendly. So I just want to call this out because if you misconfigure the plist, like if there's spaces where they shouldn't be or typos, it might break SSO functionality. So, so today you want to be very, very uh, careful with the plist file as it can break things. Uh, we may make things more forgiving in the future. And finally, I want to call out uh, that there is not support for using FIDO keys as an auth method in that SSO extension window to actually provision the PRT. Uh, so we do want users to move towards passwordless, but the best method on Macs for setting up the SSO extension is going to be the authenticator, uh, the Microsoft Authenticator app phone sign-in passwordless mode, uh, which I'm going to turn it back to Mark to discuss next. All right, thanks a lot, Michael. That was a lot in that third recommendation, but lots of good stuff there. So our fourth recommendation is to use the Authenticator app and start moving your users to passwordless. So as Michael just talked about how the company portal on Mac OS acts as a token broker and gets that primary refresh token, the Authenticator app on iOS and iPad OS behaves the exact same way. It acts as a token broker. So just by having the Authenticator app on iOS and iPad OS, your users will get less prompts. So we really wanna do that. Now, if you're a customer that's deployed MFA maybe 
uh, several years ago, and we didn't really care if they, as long as they did MFA of some kind. So we have users with SMS and phone call and some with the Authenticator app. Um, and you want to start moving them towards the Authenticator app. We have a really nice feature. If you go to 8k.ms slash nudge, you can configure this. So when the users sign into Azure AD, they will have to go through the Authenticator app registration. So this is a really nice way to start moving your people to off of SMS and phone call to the Authenticator app. Now, another thing you're going to want to do with the Authenticator app is you want to move them from push notifications. So that's the, the screen you see in the upper left where you get the prompt and you just have to have approve or deny. And you want to move to number match if possible. And that's what you see there in the lower right where a number pops up and they actually have to type the number into the Authenticator app to be able to complete the MFA challenge response. This is really, really helpful for the MFA hammering technique I talked about earlier. So please go back and do this in your environment. And then lastly, if you're going to start moving your users to passwordless, which we recommend, the Authenticator app, as Michael just talked about, is a really good method to do that. It works well on iOS, iPadOS, and macOS. But let's talk about passwordless. So um, passwordless is the best user experience combined by the best security. And uh, when we talk to customers about passwordless, just in general, um, there's always some group that will say, look, we can't do passwordless. I have a mainframe for this one business unit. We have this other line of business app that does LDAP. I, I can't get rid of passwords in my environment. And we totally understand that. We're not saying that you're going to remove all your passwords overnight, but we want you to try to get to using passwords less. So any applications that you have integrated with Azure AD, you can use passwordless credentials with. And actually, Michael and I have been completely passwordless in the Microsoft corporate environment with our corporate Mac OSs since November 2020 around Thanksgiving. They, they went in, they fully scrambled our passwords, and we do not know them, so we've been completely passwordless um, since then. So though it may be difficult to remove all passwords in your environment, you may have a subset of your users that are not using those legacy applications. They are on Modern Auth, and you can start moving them towards passwordless. Okay, so the Authenticator app is one method you can use for passwordless on a Mac. The other one is the FIDO2 key. You, uh, you can see there at the sign-in window where it says sign in with Windows Hello or security key. Windows Hello is our third passwordless credential type, which is on Windows. And you'll get that login screen there on the right where you'll have to insert that FIDO2 security key. You'll have to do a proof of presence. So that, that depends on the key itself. So you might have to just touch it and enter a pin. There might be biometrics on the key. That's really up to the key itself. And that private key that's used on the FIDO2 keys then you know does the whole authentication dance signs the nonce and then you get signed in so you can use fido keys today on edge and chrome safari will be coming in the future we don't have any dates to share yet but we're well aware of this ask and we want to get that out there as soon as we can now another emerging standard i talked about earlier is pass keys this is going to be supported by apple microsoft and google um, and that pass key is synced across devices on that same device platform this is really really interesting um, so please keep an eye on this for future stuff this is good stuff all right, our fifth recommendation is single sign on all of the things. So all of the work that you've done in steps one through four won't matter much if your apps are not integrated with your IDP. So if you have applications that have their own little identity island with their own username and passwords and all that type of stuff, you will not get any of the benefit that you have with the single sign-on work that you've just done. And we've seen this come up in the Mac admin Slack and people ask, hey, I got single sign-on for all my M365 stuff and this other app. How do I get it for this other application? How do I get it for my VPN? That is exactly the right question that you should be asking. So what apps can you do this with? As Michael talked about from a prereq perspective, that's all there. But your first step is you're going to need to get the apps into your IDP. So what applications can you use in Azure AD? All those modern authentication protocols that I talked about, such as SAML, OAuth, and OpenID Connect. You can actually integrate on-prem legacy Kerberos web-based app using something called Azure AD App Proxy. And I'll get to that here in a slide or two. If you have any password-based apps where it's like the password stuffing stuff, you can use that too in Azure AD, but we really want to move you to a more modern auth protocol. And then if you have applications already integrated with F5 and Akamai, you can also integrate those with Azure AD pretty easily. We try to make this as easy as possible for you. So we actually have an Azure AD app gallery. We have over 3,000 apps pre-integrated in the gallery, and we're continuing to add more each month. And my ask here to the Mac admin community is if there are applications that your users use that are not in this gallery, please request them. If you go to ak.ms slash AAD app gallery request, you can fill out the form. 
we are more than happy to work with you, that vendor, and to get these into the gallery because once it's integrated, it's beneficial for everybody. So please fill this out. And if you're uh, not getting any traction, you're not kind of getting any responses to anything, feel free to ping myself or Michael on Twitter on the Mac admin Slack, and we'll see what we can do to get it going for you. Okay, so that's for your modern authentication applications. Let's take a look at those legacy on-prem Kerberos applications. We have a feature called Azure AD App Proxy. It's a reverse proxy. It uses port 80 and 443 outbound. There is no need Need to use a VPN for any of this. So it automatically goes out. So if you have applications that are claims aware that you haven't moved to Azure AD yet, you can use that too. But the most common scenario we see are these, those on-prem web apps that use a Kerberos authentication under the covers. You can integrate those with Azure AD. You will get single sign-on to those applications through Azure AD. And all those conditional access policies that I talked about, those will also apply to the Azure AD app proxy apps without having to make any changes to the application itself. So you can do things like requiring MFA or compliant device to get to that Kerberos application through Azure AD. Okay, last recommendation here part here is, I said at the very, very beginning of this talk, that Azure AD is not just a single sign-on for Office 365 and Azure, it's a full-blown identity access as a service, and we're continuing to add more features every day. But what we've seen with some customers as, as they start to move some of their applications up to Azure AD, we can start to use some of the benefits of the identity access service solution. So things like, uh, I'm going to create a dynamic group, and that dynamic group is going to then automatically provision users to an application. So you can have something that says, you know, if they're a, a member of sales, they automatically get put into a group and then that group automatically has access to Salesforce and will automatically provision users or deprovision users to Salesforce. So today you might be doing that. Some customers do that by hand. Some people have like a CSV file that they upload, or maybe you actually have a script that does this and it runs on someone's workstation and it's fine for now, but you'd like maybe a little more resiliency there in case someone leaves or you accidentally gets deleted. You can start moving things like that to Azure AD. There's lots and lots of governance features. So things like entitlement management. So let's say a bunch of people are working on a project. They have to have access to certain SharePoint sites, maybe certain applications and resources. They can be granted for the, their part of the project. And when they're done with the project, they can be cleanly removed from those resources. Or maybe you have users that um, there's a birthright set of applications that everybody gets in the organization. You can define that as an entitlement management package. They all get that. And when they leave, they would remove all those access. So that's really, really helpful there. A really popular feature in that is access reviews. This is a way that you can delegate to the business unit who has access to those applications and they can make that decision should they have access. So we have customers that say, these are the people that have access to this Adobe Creative Suite. This is the licenses we're paying for. Should all these people have those licenses? And now the business unit can decide, actually those people shouldn't have licenses so they can click remove and it will automatically remove them from the access to that application. So this is a good way instead of you as an admin trying to keep track of this stuff, you can move that out to the business unit itself. And then lastly here, sometimes when the applications are off on their own identity island, we have like, you know, we want to do strong, auth strong authentication there. So they have maybe sometimes multiple uh, authenticator apps. When you integrate the apps with Azure AD and you work with your identity access management team, they can use that corporate, whatever you're using today, like the authenticator app, the FIDO key, you can use that here with those applications. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael to kind of recap here and do our some go-dos. All right, so just to recap, uh, the first go-do is work with your identity and access management and security teams on the end user experience. So we want to understand where are our users being prompted? Do we have devices that are showing as unmanaged? Use the data that you have in your environment to figure this out. So we provide a nice workbook for you, or like Mark said, you can recreate these reports yourself. But we need to figure out, does the problem exist in the first place? Number two is get that Mac integrated with your MDM. So we want MDM management, and if possible, we want to provide compliance via Intune or third-party integration with Intune so that we can use that max state in our conditional access policies. So we can tailor policies at corporate and healthy max versus unmanaged max. Then we want to deploy the Azure AD Enterprise SSO plugin to macOS and iOS. We primarily focused on macOS, but the same functionality exists on iOS where we can use PRTs. Number four, nudge your users to use Microsoft Authenticator app on iOS and Android in passwordless mode. Move towards passwordless in general. If you have Windows users, look at Windows Hello for Business. FIDO keys are really good for users who move from workstation to workstation. And the Authenticator app is a very, very easy way to get started with passwordless. The number five is more SSO. So get your applications integrated with your IDP. Talk Again, talk to your identity and access management team. We wanna move away from having requirements 
where users need to have line of sight to a DC. So we want to move away from VPNs. We want to move away from assuming the user in the app will always be able to find Active Directory. And with that, thank you. Uh, the slides are available at aka.ms slash AAD Mac admins 2022. Uh, should just be a GitHub link. Um, and thank you everybody for your time. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate that. Michael and Mark. Let's see. I don't see any current Q&A here. You've done such a good job. But maybe I was on mute. <laughs> um, I think uh, Grace and Owana and Curtis probably took care of it. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to just give it another second here to see if there's any additional Q&A, but uh, I think you've got it pretty much well covered here. And um, we'll probably just uh, say send any additional feedback to the uh, Slack channel. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you again for presenting today's second session. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Well, that wraps up today's campfire sessions, everyone. Oh, like a question just came in. Oh, yes, one question. Okay. Two questions. Well, one question and somebody commenting that they asked a question. Do the Kerberos and Microsoft SSO extension interfere with each other? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is no, you can use both of them. Uh, the Kerberos extension can still provide SSO to those on-premise applications that you haven't migrated yet. And the uh, Azure AD SSO extension can be there side by side, providing SSO to resources protected by Azure AD. So you can use both. Fantastic. Good to know.